So in order to understand paleo environments, geoarchaeologists have to work with the records that are available to them in the area surrounding an archaeological site. So here in the Salmon River Canyon, I'm standing next to a section called SR23. This is a section that was featured in some of my research. And what's important about this one is it holds a record of climate. That is, it holds a record of past climate related to aridity and also vegetation patterns. So in this case, climatic conditions, warmer or drier conditions, were controlling the type of vegetation that was growing on top of this uh, part of the canyon on the slopes. To figure that out, I had to look at aspects that are held within the sediments. Small white nodules and little filaments of calcium carbonate hold data about past climate in the form of oxygen and carbon isotopes. The oxygen isotope tells us about aridity in a relative way and the carbon side tells us about vegetation. What is the percentage of drought tolerant versus drought intolerant plants? So the geoarchaeologist has to learn about what techniques might be available to reconstruct paleo environments and what kinds of materials are going to be present in their study area. And finally, they need to know how to bring those two things together. They need to know how to bring their knowledge of what things can be accomplished through the study of paleo environments and what materials they have to work with. Sediments and the objects contained in sediments can tell us a lot about past environmental conditions and climate conditions. Here at Cooper's Ferry, we have a lot of different kinds of deposits and things in those deposits that help us in our uh, need to understand past ecology from both a weather point of view and plant point of view and animal point of view. So here to my left, we've got some different kinds of deposits. This one here that's kind of a yellow deposit is uh, windblown glacial dust or LUS. And LUS is a deposit that indicates glaciers grinding up bedrock somewhere in the landscape. And in our case, it's in the Salmon River Canyon, there were glaciers in the headwaters of our river basin during the last ice age. They ground up different kinds of bedrock units into flour, you might think of it. That material gets washed down, blown onto the flanks of the canyon during cold, dry episodes of Cooper's Ferry's past. Within glacial dust or loess, we can also find really thin little filaments of carbonate. And these are created by plants and their roots down in the ground. The geochemistry of these carbonates can be studied and they tell us things about aridity. They can also tell us about the kinds of plants that were here uh, at the site through time. We can look at the geochemistry of river mussel shell, snail shell, bone, teeth, different kinds of natural data recorders about environments of the past. By excavating carefully, keeping the stratigraphic units separate as we go, we can understand the climate conditions associated with these different phases of the site's history. So I'm using a portable x-ray fluorescence device that allows us to measure the geochemistry of sediments and rocks and really anything that you pointed at. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using the portable x-ray fluorescence device or also known PXRF. We're using it to measure the geochemistry of the sediments that are inside pit feature P1. And this is the pit feature that produced stem points last year, 2012. And what I want to know by doing this is how does the geochemistry of the fill that's inside the pit, that is the, the sediments that were put inside to bury those projectile points, how does that compare with the other geochemistry of the other stratigraphy layers? So by being able to characterize this geochemically, that is what elements are present and in what quantities, I can use it as a pattern matching tool to say this sediment is unique. It is definitely fill of a pit, not some other natural stratigraphic layer. Or in contrast, it is not part of the 1960s backfilling event from previous archeologists. So it's just another tool that we can use to characterize things, understand them, separate them, and make sense uh, of the stratigraphic record that's at the Cooper's Ferry site.